Hey. Hello, my name is Devin Narine Singh. I'm one of the co-programmers of Flattery NYC this year. Um, welcome to everyone to our second conversation of Flattery and Boulder. Um, we are really, really excited to have Joanna Priestley and May Filippo here with us. Um, our official q and start time is 9 p.m. So I'm gonna wait maybe like a minute or two and then we can start. Um, I'm just gonna pull up the bios. And just as an FYI, we have two more Q&As tomorrow at 10 a.m. Mountain Time with Ngozi Anwa and Portia Cobb, and then 12, 11 a.m. Mountain Time with Deborah Strachman. And I'm just gonna pull up the bios because it's officially nine o'clock. So just so let everyone know a little bit more about our artists, Joanna is the director of Voices. And Joanna Priestley has directed, animated, and produced 31 films. Her work maintains a high level of posterity between serious exploration of boundaries and intuitive whimsy, and she's dedicated to experimentation technique, theme, and content. She's received fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts, American Film Institute, the McDowell Colony, Fundacion Valaprizio, and Creative Capital. May Filippo studied filmmaking at the University of Rhode Island and at the Art Institute of Chicago. Filippo lived in New York City for many years and made the majority of her early films there. Oh, I forgot to mention, Mary's the director of Who Do You Think You Are? Often self-reflective and richly discursive, Filippo's work explores the formal periphery of documentary strategies and the intersection of the personal and the political. Thank you both for joining us. It is truly an honor to have you both with us for these incredible and vital films. Um, how are you both doing before we jump into the formal check-in? Good, okay. Pretty good, how are you? How are you? <laughs> I'm good, it means exciting that we have this opening, I know it's not opening night, opening night was the 12th, but this is like an opening night for Q and A's and it's really exciting. The yeah. last conversation, I'm not sure you, if you, you had a chance to watch went really well. Um, Sue Neal, one of our other co-programmers, moderated that with, with Renee Green and Patty Chang. And yeah, I'm excited to hear more about these two really special and incredible films that were a joy to discover in researching prior films that screened at the seminar. Um, I'm excited to be here. It's um, I've judged a couple of film festivals during the pandemic so far, and this and those two things have been real highlights for me because I really feel connected with the, you know, a broader world. I mean, that's a problem now because we feel so isolated, but this is absolutely great to have this opportunity to connect with, with you and, you know, across the country, in the middle of the country. And Well, that's actually an interesting point to start off with because I feel like connection is a really central part of both these works in different ways. In Voices is a constant dialogue of the outside world versus the inside world. Like, how do I perceive the world? How do I perceive myself? And back and forth. And who do you think you are? There is also that sort of interplay of sorts on them. And I feel like if Voices is perhaps the more positive one, saying, like, if I manifest a good energy, if I manifest a good outlook, I will have a good life. Who do you think you are? Is like, what happens when we succumb to that negativity? And I feel like Voices is an incredible representation of mental illness. And Who Do You Think You Are is an incredible representat representation of addiction. Mm -hmm. um, it uses cigarettes as this incredible means of showing addiction. I know we often think of addiction as drugs or alcohol, but to me, right. food, sex, cigarettes, sure. substance is a substance is a substance. A drug is a drug is a drug. Yeah. So I think it's interesting to think of isolation and connection in relationship to these two works, and especially in relationship to COVID at this moment. So maybe we can use that as a starting point of sorts. Sure, sure. I mean, um, you know, uh, I was smoking cigarettes when I made the film. Um, I, I stopped soon after, but, um, you know, it, it was more like the addiction in a sense was more about um, watching ads and, and, and um, you know, measuring myself up to ads or like thinking of myself in terms of um, mainstream, um, you know, media, um, you know, trying to figure out who you are mm -hmm. based on these external 
uh, images instead of something, you know, I mean, that you can't really separate those from your internal ideas of who you are. So, um, yeah. 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 With voices, I, um, gosh, just to remind everybody, it's been like 35 years since I made this, so quite a while, but I, um, I want to deal with my fears. Uh, fear of the dark side, fear of monsters like rapists, um, fear of aging, fear of becoming overweight, uh, and fear of global destruction, which, you know, that fear is still very much in my mind, even way more so now. Um, and one of my intentions was to sort of daylight those fears. Um, and animation is a great, great medium for dealing with tough subjects um, because it's, it appears very friendly and people are willing to engage and to look. So, um, and as I work, I, 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 I usually start with a storyboard I did in this case, but as I work, I'll go off, I'll go off on, um, you know, other experiments. So other things sort of filtered into that film, but I think it pretty much stayed to that core of dealing with fear. Hmm. Yeah, that's why the next film I made was um, called Feel the Fear, um, which is um, about more about um, alcohol addiction than um, cigarette smoking. But um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the addiction is more, um, I think the film, and, and you mentioned the idea of failure in your questions that you sent us, um, the idea wasn't so much about failure to become, you know, not addicted anymore as much as, you know, actually failure to do something heroic, to do something that was really, you know, going to be really effective in terms of um, making films that help, you know, make the world a better place. So that was, that was the, the idea of um, uh, the failure, the, the idea of like how we, how we failed, not, not to, become unaddicted, but to, to do something heroic. I love that you asked about failure, Devin, um, because that is such an important part of my career. I know um, it's, it's almost to the point now where failure is positive for me. It took me a long time to get to this point because failure is always very challenging and difficult, but um, I, I definitely feel now very clearly in my career that failure is really positive. And I, I'm always trying to um, capitalize on my failures and capitalize on my mistakes. I will always, always take a mistake um, that I made in the animation and use it always because there's it's just a richer source material than what I had planned always because it makes me think in different directions. Um, and failure was particularly important in the feature I did recently, abstract, completely abstract feature, um, because I started out by by getting a um, a um, fellowship at an artist's um, residency program in the very far north in the Yukon um, next to the Arctic Circle. And I went up there and I, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I started, um, I just started walking around the town and around the surrounding area. And eventually I started doing some animation experiments about what I saw and what the people I encountered. And I ended up working very hard there. And I ended up working when I got home for about seven months total. And it was a total failure, complete failure. It didn't go anywhere, it didn't make sense to me. I couldn't figure out what to do with it. So I just put it aside for six months. And then when I came back to it, I'm like, I'm gonna use this somehow. So I started pulling the, this was pretty realistic animation. I started pulling apart the realistic animation and just taking elements and combining the elements in weird ways. And that's how I ended up, it narrowed down the, the field of the imagery into completely abstract uh, material. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I would have gotten there without that whole failure process. What's the title of it? It's North of Blue. North of Blue. North of Blue. I think that's, I think you both bring up some really interesting points about, there was, I'm gonna just take a little part of a question I had written um, I'm not gonna really read the rest, but there was just going back to this idea of failure. Um, both of these films speak to a highly autobiographic nature and speak to our current moment of representation, but also the creation of representation. 
how is the like the constantly morphing images and voices any different than how the Instagram filters that allow us to alter our appearance? Or even I would go a step further because you're talking about failure on almost this emotional spiritual level, going on like a dating app and creating this perfect image of self, perfect image of this, and we become very normalized to those behaviors. That the idea of any remote aspect of our humanity of our failure is destructive. Mm -hmm. I think it's. These, it comes to mind in both of these works because I think I think to visualize failure is still very taboo for many reasons. And I think both of these works are approaching failure head on. And I think, Joanna, what you just said about embracing failure as part of an artistic process sort of ties into a, a question that I had written for the end about like, how does it feel to revisit these works nearly like you said, it's 35 years ago. Like this is almost 40 years later and you both have gone on to make works since then. You both have, have your practices have evolved and changes in different ways. What is, not only what, what are, there were many political concerns about these pieces that I think are still very apparent in your later work. So I'd be curious to hear about that sort of transition too. And I think Joanna, your answer started to touch on it. And Mary, I know you recently completed a new feature as well, so I would love to hear about that too. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that was part of the idea that, you know, the, the, the character of myself in the film, Who Do You Think You Are, sees like strong, perfect people and um, knows that sh she's not one. But, you know, that's an illusion. So the strong, perfect people are, are you know, constructed, you know, their Hollywood ads or Hollywood movies or ads or something. So, so that, that she learns, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's not clear in the film, but the idea of through the humor, I think, is that it's suggested that she sees that, um, you know, that those are um, sort of ridiculous, like, especially, you know, at the end when the, the Viking is lighting a cigarette with a, or a cigar or something with a, with a big torch and stuff, you know, like that just said that the, the um, you know, how I, it's so ironic at the end. So that um, you'd think she might have learned that uh, an image is only, only an image, you know, and that really to do something, um, you know, um, really constructive in the world, you need, you know, hard, boring work and to work with a lot of people. And, you know, so it isn't, you know, like, like the movies. So um, that was important, I guess, to try to try to show that um, in the film. And in the, in the last film I made, um, you know, it took me uh, about 15 years to make it, mainly because I was um, studying economics, because the film is about how economics is taught. So it took me a really long time as an outsider to um, understand and deconstruct the models of mainstream economics. So that's, that's this is my big heroic effort to do that. And um, yeah, I think uh, it's a lot of boring work and a lot of people helped. So maybe that's, um, that's what I learned or some of things. You know, Devin, one, one the element of your, um, your question that really puzzles me is about the um, the Instagram filters, and I just want to make sure I understand the question because is that do you mean like the Mayfair and the Juno filters on Instagram that you put on photos? I guess more like there's there are these filters where you put on and like it will make your skin glistening. It will make you look like picture perfect of sorts. Like it's when we put ourselves on Instagram, like we put like in like a sepia tone, so it looks artistic and aesthetic and all these. Yeah, with richer colors and yeah. Well, um, and you, you're trying to link that to metamorphosis in animation and um, that metamorphosis is one, is one of the really unique things about animation. And um, it's, it's more, it's about transformation. So you have to know your start point, you have to know your end point, and then you start animating in the middle and you animate your way out to the other end so that you have this like complete morph from one one you know element that is integral to the scene to the the transformation into the other element that's integral to the scene, so um, it's very different from filtering. I just want to point that out. Um, but I see what you mean in terms of showing your perfect self because 
it does take, um, that's another fear that you deal with. Like if you're doing a, a uh, somewhat autobiographical work like Voices about what you, what you put out there. Um, I think we lost Mary, so um, I'm gonna just send a quick text. Maybe the cat jumped on her computer. <laughs> that happens. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No problem. You were saying? You know, I want well, I want to ask you a question while we're having an interlude here. Um, I know Flaherty's has always included animation and documentary. Mm. And it looks like Mimesis does as well. Um, so tell me about that. How did that start happening? Or is it just is it just animation that touches on documentary? To be quite frank, I can't speak for Mimesis, but um, oh, hey, hey, Mary. Sorry about that. I think I just switched um, phones because um, I don't have the internet here. I have uh, hotspots on two different phones, so hopefully that was so I couldn't hear everything. I'm sorry. I don't know what Joanne was saying, but I know it was about the um, the morphing. Um, the, those um, those filters and stuff. So sorry. All good. Um, Joanna just <laughs> asked about the the relationship between animation and Flaherty and Mimesis. Um, oh. I was saying I really can't really speak from Mimesis. I know from Flaherty, I did have the great pleasure of speaking with um, Linda Blackby, who um, programmed the film when it was at the seminar, and she had mentioned that this was one of the first years that the video arc was being brought into the seminar. As for why we chose it and like programming in this year, I guess to me, I just, I can't, sp I'm just speaking for myself, like it does feel like a document, even though it's, to me, an animation can easily just be as a document as anything else. And it's just an aesthetic choice. It's, and it feels, it, in the way that, Fuses by Schneeman is a documentary. Animation is a documentary. Yeah, I mean, there's that idea that, you know, everything is a documentary in a sense that it, it it's an evidence of the time that it was, when it was made, you know, like just um, when you, I think, what is it, Bill Nichols calls it documents of wish fulfillment or something like that versus documents that are social representation, the two different kind of documents so that, or documentaries. So, um, yeah, I mean, in that sense, it's, it's evidence or something, right? And of course, in animation, there is a whole genre of very um, sort of strict documentary work. And now that we see in a lot of festivals, the programs just of animated documentaries. Mm. It's like science. It's my favorite work, part of the like, genre. Like things like that, sci science works and things like that? Or, or, uh, it, it encompasses everything. Um, I did another um, short that was um, a documentary about a um, corrections officer in a prison and an inmate in a prison. Mm. So they're drawings instead of photo photo yeah. photographs. They're drawings, but yeah. the, it was based on interviews. So the um, mm -hmm. people are actually speaking and then mm -hmm. just all animated. Right. What has, I mean, I consider both of these films documentaries, even though they are not documentaries in the sense mm -hmm. that Mary's film has a lot of, st is consisted of a stage re reenactment. Joanna, your film is animated, which people are like, oh, like they, like you were saying, like there's those misconceptions about it. Like what, I guess my question I would want to think through is, in the process of making these films, was documentary at the first and foremost of the process or was other set of concerns in that mindset? I'd say with voices, um, I knew I wanted to make something very personal. Mm -hmm. So in a way that's documentary, yeah. yeah. That was at the core of it, definitely. I mean, you know, I, I was definitely coming out of an experimental film you know, education or um, tradition or something. So, um, yeah, I mean, um, 
and you know, um, many documentaries are experimental. I mean, I think, I suppose most documentary filmmakers think they are, you know, when they're being creative, they're being sort of experimental, I guess, or something too. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the documentary elements, I mean, in a way it's like, you know, it's a document of how I looked 30 or 40 years ago. It's, um, oh, you know, thinking of the friends who shot the film and um, their camera work or their voices. And, um, you know, there's some footage, actual documentary footage of uh, teenagers smoking um, in, in the film. That's, that's really, you know, conventional documentary. Um, otherwise, you know, there's all that found material that, you know, those are documents of, you know, um, his, you know, historical evidence of how cigarettes were um, promoted. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, I think overall, you know, it's it, first, the, my film is much more, um, you know, um, ironic or, you know, um, not so straightforward as um, as the documentary. I mean, you know, some things in the film, like I did actually have a dream, like the film begins with the retelling of some dream, but um, otherwise, I mean, um, you know, it's it's very playful. I didn't, I don't really think, you know, I'm Italios Vebo or something like that, you know, so um, it's much, much less following any kind of rules that you might think of in terms of documentary. I think we actually have a couple audience questions. So and it's a halfway point. Oh, cool. I think that's a nice, good point. But I just want to say before we answer the audience questions, thank you all for those great and really insightful answers that's bring a wide scope and was really interesting to learn not only more about these films, but about your practice. Um, yeah, let's open up some audience questions. Um, they should pop up in a sec. We hear a lot about the apocalypse. This is from Eric Holmes Esmiel. Apocalypse or pending disaster on global or species scales. Is there a way to understand these works as disasters on the level of our personal lives? Ooh, that's a really nice one. What do you guys think? You want to go first? I'm going to have to think about this for a minute. Um, I'd say in voices, I touch on this subject at the very end, but I don't go into it any depth in any depth. Um, and certainly now from 35 years later, I would like to do something that just deals with this this subject, you know, for eight minutes instead of just for 30 seconds. Right. Um, because I think that's what we're facing right now. Right, right. Yeah. Well, to deal with it in our personal lives. Um, I think that's what we're all trying to cope with right now. It's so completely threatening and overwhelming um, with species extinction and such dramatic climate change and on and on and on. Right. Um, I think that's what we're trying to do is figure out how to cope with this and just, you know, move one foot in front of the other every day. Yeah, can, I, can I see the question again, Devin? Could I see the question again? Um, uh, yep, there it is. Okay, thank you. Can we talk to Eric or that's not probably not possible? We can't talk directly to them, but they can hear us. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, wouldn't say my, that film, Who You Think You Are, is about uh, a disaster on, um, a personal level so much as, you know, um, a kind of ironic way of thinking about what can films do, you know, can, can films, you know, really um, be these great catalysts for, for change, for positive, for progressive change. And, you know, am I capable of making such a film? You know, never mind that there's obvious evidence that, that films, that that can happen, but can I make a film like that? Can I, can I make such a um, positive, um, progressive um, change, changing the world film. And um, so, you know, um, that was like a question at the beginning of my filmmaking 
career. And um, I think that uh, it still is. And, um, you know, as I've gotten older, I've tried to try to do that more and more. And, um, you know, I think in terms of things like species extinction and all the other ways that we're um, ripping the earth apart, a lot of it, you know, really comes from uh, the, our economic system and trying to, so I spent a lot of time trying to understand that and um, present it um, so that people who don't, wouldn't take an economics course, such as myself in college, um, would uh, feel like they understood what would happen if they did take one. So, um, yeah, I hope I tried to answer that question. This is from Joanna. Hi, Joanna. Could you please touch on your decision to both make your personal internal di dialogues public in your work? Well, I can try to address that. Um, interestingly, I, in the past decade, have gone into total abstraction. So mm -hmm. completely the opposite, um, not personal at all. And that is a very exciting world um, that I really passionately love right now. But um, in terms of making voices, I didn't, I was totally taken aback by um, the, after I put it, I started distributing it and showing it at film festivals that, that people thought it was so personal and started asking me very personal questions on stage. Um, so I really had to adjust to that. Um, and I, I'm not, you know, at the time it seemed like I was dealing with maybe universal fears that everyone could relate to. They were, of course, my fears, but um, I thought that that would that would be the the level that people would come to it. Um, so I was taken aback, but I think I've gotten bolder as the films I've made about thirty short films, and I did a lot of very personal short films, and they got bolder. Um, so I felt strongly that um, it was important to deal with those personal subjects. Yeah, I mean my my films. Um I think maybe became, um, I don't think they became less personal. Um, uh, you know, the, the one before, the long one about uh, economics um, is probably the most personal. Um, it's called the trickle down theory of sorrow. And, um, you know, my mother's in it and it's more documentary like. Um, my, the, I, I got married and had a son and that's part of the, the film as well. So. Um, yeah, I think I guess I've gone back and forth with the the last one is you you see me, you know, hear, or hear my voice occasionally more often than see me struggling with the material that I'm uh, trying to understand and explain the economics material. So, um, yeah, I've always felt like um, you know that the, the the phrase the personal is political and that um, you know I wanted to put myself, you know, that you're you you're it's clear that you're understanding the world through my my understanding of it. And we got one, we got, I think, two more questions actually from the audience. This is from Sarah. Thanks for your questions, Eric and Joanna. Yes, I'm also interested in hearing about the choices we make as filmmakers. Re, what is worth making? What matters? What we give our time and lives to? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A very, sure. very important exactly. question. <laughs> yeah, Sarah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it took me a long time to be as serious as um, I needed to be to um, to audit economics classes and to read, you know, a mountain of economics textbooks and other, you know, um, critical economists um, and try to, um, you know, make a very serious, although, you know, darkly humorous um, sort of piece about about that. Um, because I do think it's, you know, it's not, it's not everything, but I think, you know, if we understand, um, you know, why all these disasters are happening, um, I think we do have to understand, you know, the economic reasoning behind, behind them, so. I, um, I really put a lot of emphasis on the process in my work. Uh, it takes me usually about two years to make a film and it took me six years to make the feature. So um, 
it's very important to me to make sure that that process is really joyful and it's mm. really positive mm. and I like working with other people. So I bring in interns and they bring in a lot of energy to the process. And I spend a lot of time at the front end, making sure that I'm completely in alignment with what I'm doing. I'm being completely honest with what I'm doing. I'm dealing with a subject that I'm passionately um, interested in and involved in. Um, and it's going somewhere I want, want to go in my life. So the whole process of making the film has to be in that direction. Um, the content has to be in that direction. I don't think too much about um, audience response, although I did a little bit in the feature because it was getting so much feedback back from people saying, no one will ever look at an abstract feature. What are you doing? Are you crazy? Um, so I just stayed with my process and trusted with that. And, and amazingly, uh, people did want to see it and it's shown all over the world. And, you know, but a lot of people were, were really concerned that no one would look at that, you know, at 60 minutes worth of abstraction. Um, but that's a great question. And I think what I, you know, really interesting thing to me about the pandemic is that, um, all the conversations I'm having with people now are all really focused and on important topics and people are saying what they truly feel in their heart. And I, I'm loving this kind of communication that I'm getting right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping I'm not going to be going back to sort of um, the more social, um, less, less deep and dense conversations from before the pandemic. This, any thoughts on that, either of you? <laughs> I think, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Mary. No, go ahead. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, so my generation is the, I guess you can call us the 9 11 Columbine generation, where like that was like, I was like four when 9 11 happened. So like that was very much mm -hmm. childhood of growing up and then like Obama wins and like that's the early memories, Trump being the first election you can vote in and that being a very formative memory. So like, there's been that conscious, but I feel like this these last few months have been a very conscious awakening of sorts and has really has made me think a lot as a curator, the work I do, the institutions I work in, the as a filmmaker, the stories I tell, working a lot with found materials and the images and the representation. So I don't think there is a going back, but I think there's a question of what form that takes. I think what I love about films like all of your films is that it shows that we can operate in a highly political minds, um, um, mindscape, but also in a highly, also have a space of abstraction, of beauty, of art, um, and also of the act that the act of healing ourselves is part of that. Mm -hmm. That. I know if I am not well, I will that toxicity will exist around me as a result. Mm -hmm. and we need to heal ourselves. And, um, that, and that really came from the poet C.A. Kama, like has a story on their website basically of saying that by healing themselves, they're healing a part of the earth. Mm -hmm. And at first I dismissed that. I'm like, well, that's mumbo jumbo and whatever. But like in truth, that's not. It's that's when we heal ourselves, we don't bring our trauma forward and mm -hmm. that's healing. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's the solution to everything. I think that's part of the solution. But I think it's also getting involved in organizations, it's going to protests, it's getting active, it's getting out of the world, it's all those things. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's just one thing. Right, right. Um, but... Hi, Charles. <laughs> oh, wait, Mary, did you want to respond to that? Uh, that no, I think you guys did a great job. Okay. So regarding the mentions of moving more towards total abstraction in a movie image practice, what are the political stakes of such a move? Mm. Interesting question. In other words, oh, there's a second part to this. In other words, should these work, should those working with the movie image feel an obligation to make the politics disconcernable to some extent in their work? Wow, the politics of the abstraction, my mind is just like flying all over the place. <laughs> Mary, take that one, please. <laughs> but I'm not working abstractly. I don't know. <laughs> Devin, help me out here. Politics of um, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, 
I would love, I really would love Ooh, to know. One thing, just because there's abstraction, I'm thinking visual, maybe auditorially it's not or something. Is that, could that be the case? I mean, is every, is, is your new film abstract um, in an audio as well or, or? You know, it's, um, it's interesting because everyone that sees this film creates their own narrative. And apparently what it's, most people liken it to a drug trip or a very, very intense dream. And they all have a story they want to tell me afterwards, which for me is super fascinating. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it generates a personal narrative, even though it doesn't contain any narrative at all. Mm. But I'm wondering if um, the person that asked the question is getting more at, is it is the question about being devoid of, of actual politics? So that's that's neglecting a certain aspect of life. Could that be? Charles, if you're there, can you write a response and we can bring it up? You know, speaking until we hear from Charles again, I mean, one thing that you said, Joanne, about, you know, a, a kind of a joy or something that you get from making um, your work. And I don't think of, um, I think of my process as being pretty, um, pretty, pretty uh, strenuous and difficult. But there, when it works, there's a joy, you know. So, like, if I've been able to figure out how to make, you know, this cut work, or you know, these two images work together, or something, there's the pleasure of that. But mostly, um, it's like workety work, you know. Like, I'm not, um, I'm not getting like this big um, sense of, um, I don't get a like the process isn't, is uh, is often very, um, very taxing and, you know, difficult or something like that and, instead. But I think if I didn't do it, I would feel worse or something like that. So I'm kind of like, you know, it's like this guilt thing. If I didn't, if I didn't do this hard work, I would feel even more, I would feel worse or something. So. Even though I do try to make the, the daily process joyful, um, there are really difficult things about filmmaking always. Right. Always. Right. And, you know, everyone who does it, we could talk endlessly about that. But um, ultimately, it has to be, the rewards have to be good enough for us to face those difficult challenges. Yeah. There was, um, I'm actually going to, if it's okay to jump in, um, there was um, last year at the seminar, um, the artist Helgel Frand Frandl, I don't want to mispronounce her last name. She's um, a German filmmaker um, who works extensively in Super Eight, and she'll shoot like a, a Super Eight Cotters, and that will be the film. Um, and she's shown that anthology, she's shown around the world, and she was one of, the, one of the feature artists. She actually said something that's really stuck with me a lot, and especially over going back to, to Joanna's point, like, how do we feel post? COVID and Charles's question about art making and like what is our role as art makers is really resonated in a way that it's a response that's taken time for me to really appreciate. Um, uh, to basically recap it in a very general way and not speak on her behalf. So wait, what did she say, Devin? Oh, sorry, Charles, I'm gonna read what Charles said in one sec. Basically what she said was, because there was a question of course, like, how, what's the political nature of her work? Because, like, her work, like, one of her work was, like, showing runners about to run, and that would be the film. Mm -hmm. Or showing an airplane moving over the sky, and she said, I'm preserving the earth. The earth is dying. My politics is outside of my work. I go to protest. That's more important than your political art. And I, and I, that is the one, I mean, the, the whole seminar was great. And Shai, or if anyone from last year's seminar was watching, Great year, so much fun. But that's the remark that stuck with me the most and has really, really whirled in my head a lot. I feel like that could be an interesting thing to consider too in this conversation is Definitely. maybe we don't owe the work a political nature. Maybe our politics, maybe the most useful things we can do as, as citizens is not our work. It's phone banking. It's going to a protest. It's donating to campaigns. It's doing the more practical things. And our works can exist as a poetic extension of our lives. Yeah, I think it's all it's all individual, you know, like that um, that's not what what I I wanna do, but that doesn't mean that, you know, it's someone else's 
it's not valid to to hold that uh, opinion or make that kind of work at all. I mean, um, you know, for me, it's really Im important for me to think that I'm getting at something that I want to understand and trying to present it to someone, you know, hoping that someone is out there that wants to, you know, wants to um, see what I've, what I've made. But um, yeah, for me, it, it is, the work is also, and you're, you're right that, you know, so I don't know how effective it is and, and perhaps, you know, making a donation or going to a protest is actually more effective, but that, the, for me, um, the political aspect of the work is really important. That's a good point. I think um, I definitely have a uh, an involvement in, in protesting the government as much as I can right now. But in in my work, which I keep separate from that, um, I think with the feature film, one of my intentions was to create something very relaxing because I was seeing so many people stressed out. I was feeling stressed out. Um, and I thought, oh, let's engage in something very relaxing. So in a way that does Charles address a slightly political aspect, um, been in a roundabout way. But what was Charles' comment? Let's look at that again. Could, Michelle, could we pull up Charles' comments again? Ah. <laughs> um, can we pull up the initial comment? We could also move on to another one too. I think that might actually, I think Charles is actually our last comment, um, unless someone else has written it in. Oh, so we do have a, this is from, I don't want to mispronounce your name, Karagini. Abstraction, if you like, of being in the place where the images were brought in to you by the spirit Gwichin. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, that's an interesting question, nonetheless. Um, so does that re relate to the Trundak Wichin from um, from the far north? Because that's definitely, I definitely, you know, love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Peoples of the Yokan, yeah. Trundak Wichin, yeah. What um, is that about? So the, um, the first inhabitants there where I was in Dawson were the, the, um, the Wichin. I don't, I'm maybe not pronouncing it correctly. And um, they were forced to move out when the gold rush happened. Um, and the entire tribe had to move down river from a place where they'd probably been, you know, for 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's was sort of hard to connect um, with, with um, First Nation peoples there, but I did have a couple of great connections and one, one fellow just came up and started talking to me. And um, so I, he said I could, walk with him. So I spent like three hours walking around going to the to the um, the gas station to get a lottery ticket. And and I think if I had only spent a month there, and I think if I'd spent more time, I would have been able to find out more about the tribal peoples. But thanks for that quick, that interesting comment. Hi, Kelly. Um, um, so this is from Sunil, one of our co-programmers. Mm -hmm. I think on the topic of abstraction politics, the gesture of giving people space to move away from the terror and disaster of the contemporary world is in itself a political move. I was thinking about um, self-care is very. Oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Also, self-care is very real and necessary, and film can give us that space potentially. And I will most certainly agree with that. Thank you, Sunil, for that question. Yeah, I, I would say too, you know, I was thinking, um, talking to uh, John Janvito who programmed the Flaherty when I was in it and he asking him what he's showing now, you know, once we, we both teach and, um, you know, um, in March, you know, uh, trying to think of films to show that, you know, somehow relate to um, the situation. And he said, you know, I'm gonna show S Sullivan's Travels instead. So, you know, um, do you know that film, the Preston Sturgis film? So, you know, uh, Sullivan, instead of making these hard hitting political films, um, realizes that his fun is humor. He, he's made humorous films. The, the character that uh, who's playing a director in the film um, realizes that um, the importance of humor instead, you know, and I guess um, 
I guess I feel like um, I don't think, you know, you can see from the film that, that's in the program that although I think of my films as being political, I hope, I think they're humorous and, and entertaining. So, I mean, I, I try to make things that are political, but that are not like, don't wear you out, but instead make you feel, you know, sort of liberated or um, maybe like kind of informed or in, and liberated or something. That's my, that's my desire. Excellent goal. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it's a good goal. Getting there. Another. What are you working on now, Mary? So the film that I have just finished, um, that I've work, been working on for 15 years, is called um, My Miseducation in Three Graphics. <laughs> and, it, and it's about uh, auditing economics courses at, in uh, colleges at University of Rhode Island and at Brown, and then um, taking apart the models that the economists, uh, the way the, mo the economists present the you know the issues of um, that are you know so fundamental to all of our lives how they model them in order to kind of justify the um, the status quo and the destruction of the earth and you know, all that so so it's um, took me a really long time to understand what was wrong with the models and then to be try to explain it in a way that was. Um, I hope, you know, I hope is um, digestible in, in a one hour format. So I just finished it. And mostly I've been um, trying to get economists to show it in their economics classes. And that's, that's kind of my first audience. I'm not sure if the film, um, if viewers need to have taken an economics class in order to get it. So it might be have a smaller audience than my original intention. I spent a lot of time um after the pandemics and home quarantine started, um, deciding how I could do a film that um, that looked at the sort of um, pre-human Earth, full of plants and animals, and then the arrival of humans, and then structures, and then bigger structures, and bigger, bigger, bigger structures, until we get into like the mega skyscrapers. Mm -hmm. And um, and then how eventually that whole world is going uh, awry, and but plants will definitely take over again. Mm -hmm. uh, even the cities, they'll take yeah. over again. Yeah. Yeah. Even the freeways, they'll break apart. And yeah. um, and so just like with North of Blue, that footage <laughs> is not working. Nothing's working. Um, I put a lot of work into it. Maybe now two months of work, but. I totally had to set it aside, but I'm kind of excited with that that failure. Mm -hmm. because I know something inter interesting is going to come out of it. Yeah, that's, so that's where I'm at with it. But I just yeah. haven't been able to work on any um, animation for about a month. Mm -hmm. Frustrating. So I just create other projects. Um, yeah. I decided to do a, a slideshow about the art of Burning Man. And I don't know where that's going to show or what's going to happen with that. But mm -hmm. you know, you just find other ways. Maybe I work on publicity something that I don't normally spend any time on. I've worked on some of that stuff. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, important, unfortunately, you know, a big part of what we seem to have to do is promote what we do too, right? So we have to promote it and we have to distribute it. Right. So thank you, Devin. It's very different here than other countries because yeah. all my friends in all the other countries they have producers, they have distributors, they have everything. They have televisions that want to show their work. They just, just hand it over and oh, someone awesome. takes care of that, but not in the United States. We have to do all of that. Yeah. You are both incredible examples of keeping a voice that is original, persistent, and that has just kept growing and growing over time. Mm -hmm. And we do sadly have to wrap up this conversation, but this was such, such a treat. I am glowing and grinning to have spent time with both of you and your incredible minds. This was really a really insightful talk and thank you both for everything. And for anyone who's in the talk, these films are up to the 18th, please watch them, watch them again. You will get something out of them at the time. Joanna, Mary, thank you both again. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Have thank a good you. Night. Nice to meet you, Joanna. Bye. Yeah. Nice bye to bye. meet you, Mary. Bye. 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 bye.